Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful um, for the time that we have to study and for the fellowship that we can have, the friendships that we can have as well. And we just pray, Lord, that you can be with us as we open your word together. May Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and to those who are watching these videos and are searching for truth. We know, Lord, that there's much we do not understand. And uh, we come as learners. Um, we know, Lord, that you have been teaching us and leading us. And uh, we know that the purpose is to reveal your character to the to the world. We pray, Lord, that we can receive of your character, of your righteousness, and that it can be seen. We pray for your angels' care and protection for our loved ones. We ask, Lord, that um, uh, the trials that we face uh, will develop in us a Christ-like character. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning again. I, I just want to draw your attention to, uh, um, and, well, somebody asked a question about yesterday's study. And, and if you go to yesterday's study, you can see my answer to the question. They were just wondering where these numbers 483 and 3964 came from. Um, so I gave an explanation if anybody has more questions on that. And um, so that's why this is highlighted. I was copying uh, that uh, those definitions for for the response. Now we've been looking at Daniel 11 verse 17. Now one of the things, of course, that we do is we look at these lexical numbers, and you know, and God uh, directed us to this um, when we were studying Judges. So we started looking at well first the Hebrew numbers, and then as we got into Daniel chapter 11, we started these. Uh, the numbers for the whole verse itself. Now, uh, so this verse, uh, Daniel 11, verse 17. So we know 11 times 17 is 187, and that the 187th prime number is 1117. So it should be an interesting verse from the point of the symbols that are in it. And we can see that uh, we have uh, gematria here as well. The differential is 711. It has those same digits as 1117. And we, we have these numbers representing July 18th. Um, uh, the book, uh, let me see, the lexical sum of 78,408 is interesting. Um, so this number itself is, um, I'll just, I'll just put it in here, 78. 8,408. So this is, you can see that it's two times two times two, three times three times three times three times 11 times 11. So it gives us that symbol that we have in uh, Daniel chapter 11, of course, that pivotal verse, but also the two 11s, 11 generations to the flood, 11 generations to the entering into Egypt, uh, the 11 years of Joseph from being sold into slavery to the dreams of the butler and baker, and then the 11 years uh, to uh, his dreams being fulfilled, right? So so those symbols we're very familiar with. Um, now, you can see that uh, this number itself uh, has in it, uh, it, it can be divided, well, by 36. And if you divided it by 36, uh, you would get the number a 2178. But notice that it has these different iterations. I'm going to make this bigger because this is tiny. Um, so we have an iteration of, of, you know, the 1872 numbers, right? So those numbers. Um, now, if we had four digits, one, uh, like 1278, those four digits, there's 24 different possibilities in a four digit number for those numbers to show up, right? So out of 10,000 possible uh, arrangements of four digit numbers, uh, you're gonna have 24 times that uh, you, you would have 
those numbers in some order or other. Now, this number has it in uh, four different iterations. So you can see here you have 8712, you have 7128, you have 2178, and 1782. Now, each one of these is an iteration that is just an iteration. That is, you don't have uh, like a 7, um, like a 1872, right? So... You never have it in that order or in the reverse order or eight, eight, one, seven, right? It's eight, seven, one, right? But that means out of the possible 24 iterations, uh, that you would have in, in, in a number, right? Of, of these, this is going to have four of them, which is, is rather interesting. You know, at least I think it is. Um, we also have other things that we can see that, uh, 216, which would be 6 times 6 times 6. You have the 264 in there. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's an interesting number. Another way that we could look at this is this would be 8 times 81 times 121. If we, we took, because 11 times 11 is 121. 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 is 81. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. Uh, so you can see all those divisors there. Um, so now, if we multi, if we divided this number by 360, so that's where I noticed this first, is I simply uh, took the number, okay, clear this. So I just took this number, so it's 78408, that's the lexical number, and I divided it by 360. And of course, I'm going to get that iteration, 217 prophetic years and 0.8, right? So, so the chances of that happening is it's one in 416.6 or something like that. So if I'm, if I'm going to take a number, uh, and, and, and divide it by 360, that would also create, uh, even a more unlikeliness. So the chances that we just took this number, divide it by 360, and we have this number that represents July 18, 2020, while the verse itself represents July 18th is interesting. The other thing, the actual number of days from the time of the end. So, so when I look at a big number like this, 78408, I've, I've been dealing with numbers so long, I can sort of figure out how long it's going to be, um, even before I do the division. But if I divide it by 365.25, you're going to see it's, it's 214 years. And, and then a decimal, right? Um, so I, I take off the 214 years and I times by 5.25, and that will show me that it's going to be uh, 214 years and 244 and a half days, right? You know, directly. Now, depending on which uh, date you start on, like which um, which year, whether you're you know, the leap years, so forth, is going to affect exactly which date it will go on. But if we start at 1798, and we go to February 15th, and we count 70, 78,408 days, um, we get around his birthday in 2012 when he turns 35. So it's just a little interesting number that I wanted to draw your attention to. And um, so I don't know if there's any questions about that. But that's that's just what happens when we deal with this lexical number um, of this verse that we've been looking at, Daniel 11, verse 17. So I thought I'd draw your attention to that. Okay, so now we were dealing with a lot of this history yesterday. Now, I did put in, um, since yesterday, I put in the Hebrew numbers um, for this verse, so it's just Look slightly different. So for verse 17, now we have all of those numbers. So if you added them all up together, they'd be 78,408 uh, for this verse. Now, um, now Stephen's not here today, but uh, yesterday, you know, we were discussing basically how to interpret um, thus shall he do. Now, I favor the idea that it's God has appointed Right. You know, and, and, you know, we could say appointed maybe by his providence. Right. 
So I look at this as God has a providence, uh, a prov by his providence. It didn't go in the right spot. Uh, why is that? I thought I clicked in the right spot. Yes, I didn't. There we go. So God is appointed by his providence. So I'm saying that now there is, um, and then when it says he shall give him. So we could argue that it's Ptolemy giving his, his daughter Cleopatra. Um, to Julius Caesar. But um, I, I don't really think that that's what happens, right? And and one of the things we focused on was this, the, this, uh, the daughter of women, what that really means. You know, so, and I don't know why I put 803. I'm pretty sure that's 802. I'm just going to check that. Uh, that's 802. So, um, so let's go back to this discussion. Now, one of the reasons I say that this is talking about God and his providence uh, has to do with what we looked at um, with verse 14. Right. So um, the sons of the breakers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. Now, we, we know that um, that Rome is not doing this to establish the vision on their own, right? Like, they, they, they don't know anything about this prophecy. They're not coming into history at this time to establish the vision from their perspective. So that means this is something that is in God's providence that has to occur. Right. A fulfillment of prophecy. W would we agree with that? That's kind of a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So so when we get to verse 17, um, what I see is I see God's hand here. And and now what is it about um, the, you know, he, if this is God by his providence, giving to Julius Caesar. Um, right. So, so God is appointed by his providence, right? Which it says, and he, God, shall give Julius Caesar, the daughter of women, being Cleopatra, corrupting her. Right. So, so why would that be God? If, if I'm correct, what, what, how would that make sense? If, if we're looking at God's providence fulfilling prophecy, why would God be doing this? What would God be trying to illustrate about this history? Um, I should note, um, I was reading a quote uh, by Stephen Haskell, and I should have probably saved it. It's, it's um, I'll find it here quickly. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll find it quickly. Um, which, which I think we, we need to consider. So this is in, of course, uh, the book, uh, the story of Daniel, uh, the prophet. I believe it's in there. Um, it could be in the seer of Patmos, actually. Um, it shows up a lot. So this, uh, this is in, uh, the story of Daniel, the prophet. And I don't know if this is the exact quote. Um, but, but this, this applies. God had an object in calling the Jewish nation to separate themselves from other nations of the world. It was that his people might stand before the world as light bearers, as a beacon set on a hill. Israel was to send beams of light to the world. The plan of education made known to Israel through her prophets was a means of keeping that light burning. When this God-given plan was neglected, the light, as a candle, deprived of the life-giving oxygen, burned dim. Then it was that the nation was pressed upon all sides by the foe. There is a Hebrew maxim which says that Jerusalem was destroyed because the, uh, the education of her children was neglected. The prophecies of Daniel and the connected history 
prove the truth of this maxim. It may be added that the Jews were restored to Jerusalem as a result of the proper, proper education of a few Hebrew boys. Now, um, there's another quote, though. Um, this is another one. It was in the providence of God that his people should carry the light of truth to all the heathen nations. What they failed to do in the time of peace, they must do in time of trouble. Babylon was the ruling power of the world. It was the educational center. The Jews were comparatively uh, a small people, right? Um, God called Abraham out from the idolatry of Chaldea and made him the father of the Hebrew, Hebrew nation. As he delivered to that people a form of government that would exalt God, as he gave them commandment, so to teach their children that the Jews would become the teacher of nations and might be an everlasting kingdom. So today he calls forth the people from modern Babylon. Um, and uh, let me see here. So there's a few different quotes. Okay, so there's lots of these. Um, no, so if we, if we think about this, so God's purpose for his people is that they're going to um, reveal his character, right? They're, they're proclaiming God. And, and so the purpose of God's people is to, to present the gospel. Right? And I want to get this other quote. I would have got the quote together if I would have been thinking about it. So it's a principle of prophecy. I mean, we, we know this principle of prophecy that uh, Bible prophecy occurs in the context of God's people, right? That is, if there is something happening in prophecy that's in and that's in God's word, if there is a story or an account or a prophecy, it's because it addresses God's people, right? We don't just have a bunch of history. It's not a history textbook um, out of all the history of, you know, Rome or all the history of Greece. It's just the history of Babylon or Medo-Persia or Greece or Rome when they're in contact with God's people, correct? Would we agree with that? Just wish I could find this quote. He says it much better than I said it. Okay, so this is the quote, I think. Um, it says here, the 17th chapter of Revelation is divine history of the power represented by the beast, which John saw arising from the sea, which is distinguished from all other beasts by its seven heads and ten horns with crowns. The prophet Daniel wrote the history of the world from the standpoint of nations. He mentions religion and especially the people of God, but he deals primarily with nations. On the other hand, the history presented to John on the Isle of Patmos was primarily ecclesiastical history. So no, that's not the quote I'm looking for. But anyway, we would agree um, that that it's when these nations are in contact with God's people. So anyway, I can't find it, um, the quote. I have to look for it again later. Um, so I can give it to you. But so... If we're looking at this story, this because I started watching all this history of Rome, and there's a lot of history of Rome that the Bible doesn't touch, touch on, that, that Daniel is not going to address. So how does this help us in interpreting Daniel chapter 11 when we're looking at this history and we're trying to apply it? You know, we're trying to understand what history is being fulfilled. What would be the main thing that we would have to think about? Because we're taking these verses in Daniel 11 and we're saying that they're fulfilled by history, right? And, and we know that Rome has exalted itself to establish the vision. Rome is going to conquer um, Egypt. It's going to conquer, uh, you know, Syria as well, right? And then it says, you know, it's going to mention this conquering of Egypt because the upright ones, the Jews, join these forces with Caesar, right, led by Antipater, right, which we're saying represents the Protestants. And then it says, thus shall he do. And I'm saying that here it introduces, even though it's implied in lots of other places, it introduces God as a he. Thus shall he do, that is, God has appointed. Thus, that is, God has appointed by his providence. So it's 
it's pointing this out that this is a providential uh, event. Right? That, that's what I'm saying. So I, I don't know if other people agree, but that's what I'm saying. That's how we should interpret this verse. That the he is not referring to Jewish Jew, Julius Caesar, but it's referring to God. So God has appointed this. And God is going to give to Julius Caesar, the daughter of women, corrupting her. Now, we, we're making an application that this is going to be um, something that's in our time that's going to be parallel in this, right? So we're saying that Seventh-day Adventists are the Jews, right? They're the upright ones. And and we're going to bring this to 9-11, this spiritual formation, right? And that God has appointed this by his providence so that in this, 9-11 is a providential event, just as uh, what happened here in ancient history was in God's providence. And then if if God is the one that's giving Julius Caesar the daughter of women, so that's the other thing is this is this is the daughter of women. And and that's not a, you know, a common, common phrase or anything. Um, I'm just going to do it this way. Um, so this is the only place in the Bible where we find this phrase. OK, in in the Hebrew. Yeah, so. That the same place we find these two words together. Right? So the daughter of woman in this way. So why are we saying that this is significant? Why is he calling Cleopatra the daughter of women? And we're saying that this is God giving Julius Caesar the daughter of women, corrupting her, using this as a symbol of something. Are you guys out there? Okay, so there is some things about this um, expression that are also interesting. Now, um, this I'm reading. Oh, so, yeah, so Ron says yes, but no, Mike. Okay. Uh, the reference here is undoubtedly to his own daughter, Cleopatra. So that's how this guy sees it, and that's not the one I wanted to read. Ah, here it is. So this expression... Uh, a woman, the plural of the of the class, um, it's used in um, the sense of in Judges 14, verse 5, when Samson went down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold, a young lion roared. So um, they're making reference to this, that this is uh, connected linguistically this young lion and and then it's going to have um uh this uh in Zechariah 9 9 rejoice so greatly O daughter of Zion shout O daughter of Jerusalem behold thy king cometh unto thee he is just in having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass and again the foal of an ass is is linguistically related to this, right? So um, I'm just going to go there. Um, they're saying this is related. It's just a commentary. This is uh, Akil and Dillich's commentary on the Old Testament on commenting on this this phrase. What does this mean? What is this daughter of women? What is the the idea here then that we need to consider? Okay, so the daughter of women, if, if we're going to say that this is the SDA, right? So, so that's uh, Ron's suggestion there. Um, so we, we know the upright ones are representing the Seventh Day Adventist Church. At least that's how we've applied this so far. So far, and so the Jewish forces loyal to Caesar by Antipater, are going to typify the Protestants and spiritual formations. That means the Protestants and the SDAs 
are going to be working together at 9-11. And this God has appointed by his providence, but also he shall give the papacy because Julius Caesar uh, represents the papacy um, in this context. So we're going to say that's the papacy. The daughter of women corrupting her. So the papacy is going to be given this daughter of women. So we could say, well, it's the SDAs, right? And, and the idea here is, is this, uh, this, that this is to, is given in the sense of being a marriage, but it's not going to be a marriage. So if this is in God's providence, he's giving what to the papacy? If we say it's just Seventh Day Adventists, because remember Cleopatra, she's the queen of Egypt. So when we look at this battle, so Julius Caesar is going to go to Alexandria, right? He's going to try to conquer Egypt. He's going to end up in the siege of of Alexand uh, um, Alexandria, right? the city of Alexandria. Uh, in this siege, uh, he, there's going to be all these riots going on. This is where Cleopatra is going to be snuck in and reveal herself after traveling for eight days in the desert, uh, be pre presented before uh, Julius Caesar, right? And they're going to begin this relationship, okay? Now, she's the queen of Egypt. Julius Caesar represents the papacy, right? So who does Cleopatra represent? Now, she's the daughter of women, right? And we would look at, well, we'd say the Protestant daughters, um, but, but here she represents Egypt. So, so what is she representing in our history? Because remember, Julius Caesar is going to conquer Egypt, but in conquering Egypt, he is given Cleopatra. So what does she represent? She can't represent Seventh-day Adventists and she can't re represent Protestants. Does she represent the world? Okay. I think that's probably the best way to look at it. So this is the world. Now, could we say that that's happening in our present time? I think it's kind of likely. Yeah. So if we're saying that, that you know, corrupting her, that is making her his mistress, um, I mean, this would apply. How would we place that? How would we describe that in our present time? So when we say in the world, we're, you know, we could say it's the UN. You know, we could say it's atheistic communism. All this. But basically, it's the whole world is being captivated by. Um, yeah. So the world, I guess, is captivating everything. So these these are all connected. Right. But this world is given to the papacy. But it's corrupting the world. So how does that happen in our time? Isn't it through the media? Okay. So how is the papacy using the media? By putting out a narrative that allows for the control of the world. Okay. So... Okay, but the, the globalist agenda is, we, we would say the globalists, you know, generally we'd say that's the UN, right? They're the globalists. They're atheistic communism. Now, the papacy, of course, is a universal church, the Roman Catholic church. It's, it's universal as well. Um, so we can see that the Protestants, the SDAs, uh, the papacy, and now the world – are are in this uh, relationship, right? That is, the world is going to be conquered by the papacy. That's what we're saying. But it's done, that is, God gives the papacy the daughter of women, that is, the world, corrupting her, right? Now, um, 
this idea of corrupting. So there's a lot of disagreement about really how to understand this. Um, it, it's the word shakhat. It means to decay, that is to cause the ruin, right? So the idea is, it's not really, a, a, I mean, it can be corrupt. It's translated as that. But but the idea is something like corrupt more um, decay that is wasting away. Right. That that's the idea of of the word. Not so much spirit moral corruption. Right. But but uh, basically ruin. Right. So ruining her. Right. It would be probably a better. Uh, translation but so so in God's providence we see that um, this that the papacy conquering the world is, is is something where God is going to give the world to the papacy uh, now corrupting her would be the world right so causing her ruin. Now, that's why this making her his mistress, um, you know, that's the way because they're looking at corruption is more like a moral corruption. But she's already morally corrupt. Um, but if we look at, at what the what it means, it would mean causing her ruin. Not. Uh, Nothing to do with her being a mistress per se, the causing her ruin. So this is going to be the fall of the of twice. The fall of what? You can just say the fall of the world. You can just say that. It just should be pretty broad, not very specific. But so it's it's going to cause the fall of the world because but God in his providence gave the papacy the world to cause the fall of the world. Now, now here it says, but she shall not stand now on his side is is added. So I, I, I put it in italics because it wasn't originally in italics here, but it is in the he in, in the King James. Um. So, so it's just basically the word uh, corrupting her and literally just she shall not stand, right? That is, this word stand means actually to, to stand up, right? It's, it's this word that we keep running into in Daniel, uh, Daniel 11, that, that means to be established, right? So the idea of Five nine seven five um, is uh, it, it's a primitive root means to stand uh, lit in various relations literally and figuratively intransitively and transitively uh, but a point arise confirm continue right so it has all these different sorts of meanings uh, attached to it and um, so this is uh, so if we're going to look at it, it's not like stand on his side. That that's actually an interpretive uh, a translation. That is, they're already interpreting it, but that what doesn't make sense to stand on his side would not be anything about the word stand, right? So on his side should not be there. So um, now the form of this word, I have to look this up. Just hang on here. Oh, come on. So it's it's the call imperfect third person feminine singular, right? So, it's, it's, so in the form of this word, um, now imperfect just means uh, because there's a perfect tense and an imperfect tense in Hebrew. So perfect just means completed, and imperfect means not completed, right? All it just means is it's just like we could say it's future tense is what, how we would translate it. So that's why 
um, she shall not stand. And then we have the word not, 3808. And that word there, just lo, is, is how it's pronounced in Hebrew, just means not or no, right? So she's not going to stand. Now the word stand, remain, endure, take one stand. Uh, to stand still, to stop, to tarry, delay, remain, continue, abide, endure, persist, be steadfast, to make a stand, hold one's ground, to stand upright, remain standing, stand, rise, be erect, be upright, to arise, appear, come on the scene, stand forth, appear, rise, or up or against. So the idea is that uh, she's not going to remain, right? Nothing about on his side in, in the Hebrew. She's not going to remain. She's not going to injure. And then, and then it says not exist, right? So they say not be for him. Now they should have the for him in italics. And I don't know why the King James is inconsistent about its italics, but this here, I'm just going to put in italics. Because there is nothing there in the verse that says this. It's not like exist for him. Um, uh, like the word, it's just the, the imperfect feminine singular again. It's, it's the word uh, tehaya, which just means uh, it's, it's uh, tav he. Uh, yod he. Now it's very similar to um, like this idea of the I am of Jehovah, right? It's sort of that that word to exist to be, right? So, and it just says um, not, and and it and it's kind of um, strange because it's lo lo. Uh, is what it says in Hebrew. So it actually has this not uh, twice in a, in a very different form than I've ever seen. So it's going to have um, so that is I don't know how to interpret that. So it's not something I'm from, I've never seen that before. So I'm not sure what the not not means. It could be. Um, I'm just gonna maybe. Hmm. Ah. Uh, okay. So I'm wrong. I think that we need to. I think what that is. It's a, a low, but that's actually where they get the for him. Um. So. It's part of this word, and so it says not, and and then it has a, a lamed, which is can mean against or to, um, which is kind of weird because they have it as for. It usually means against. Um, so I'm not sure what that would mean. I see in the form of the word now. Yeah, not to him she will be. Um, not it before him. I see. Well, some different translations of this verse. Well, people are really interpreting this uh, based on how they understand the history. It's very bad translations. Okay, so I think actually the King James has probably got that right uh, to some degree, the for him part. Um, at least... Uh, Neither shall she be for him. Um, that the word is to him. Um, so maybe could not prevent his assassination. I don't know if that's the way that I would put what that means, though. So I know I'm kind of not everybody's understanding what I'm talking about here. OK, so so there is in here when this this word uh, neither, which is translated as neither. It says, neither for him be, right? If we're going to put it uh, in into English directly from the Hebrew. Or not a to him be, 
or not to him exist, right? So the idea of be is, is, is exist. Um, any thoughts there, Dwight? Well, were the translators wrong to compare this verse with Daniel 926? This portion of the verse is what I should say. Okay. Um, let me see. So not before him? Right. Now, I don't, I don't see how that can apply. I mean, the way that, that I read this, this second verse, of course, is after three score and two weeks shall be, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Right. Yeah. And, and you get this, uh, this low. Right. This, and that, and that means, yeah, not for him. So the for him, that's the only thing that's there that's the same. So, I mean, you have, uh, and, and the thing is with the Hebrew, they, tr- they attach that to the word, right? So they attach that to the word, um, really it's attached to the word, uh, let me see, I get it. They're attaching it to the word city, um, which is kind of odd. But I have to kind of look at this. Let me see here. Karat. So the Messiah, Mashiach, Ein. Not. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's attached to the, to the not. Okay. It's just weird how they do this. As I, as I have been looking at this, using the alternate readings in this particular verse. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, of course, on his side is italicized, so it's added. Yeah. And upright ones and corrupting her are the the passage, the points in this passage that have alternates. So if we read this with the alternate, he Mm. shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and equal conditions. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women to corrupt her, but she shall not stand on his side neither before him. Yeah, those don't make sense. So equal conditions, I don't know how they, I mean, that would be taking Hebrew, put it in into English, and then taking another definition of English. Um, right, that, that wouldn't be a very good translation. Well, the other, the other part... <clears throat> Again, instead of upright ones, would be much uprightness instead mm. of equal conditions. Yeah, yeah, I don't. That doesn't make any sense. I don't see anything about much in there. Okay. That 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 it just you just have the word straight. This is straight. <clears throat> And then, of course, when we're coming to the next verse, we have alternate Hebrew in that verse as well that would return this instead of for his own behalf. And there, the alternate Hebrew is for him. So again, we have for him being presented. At where? Daniel eleven eighteen. Oh, okay. So Daniel eleven eighteen. So okay, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So for his own behalf. Now you realize that's one Hebrew word, uh, two seven eight one, which is. Backwards, 18, 18th of July, 2020, right? Um, and that's the word. 
which we've run into before. Kirpa. Yeah, I don't know how they get. Um, so, so the form of the word, that's what I'm trying to look at here. So it's, it's got a, a vav with a dot above it at the end. So, um, and it's got, so noun, it's a feminine, feminine singular. Um, I don't know if I even like this translation of the King James at all, because they're adding much more than there. Because there's, you know, to get all of that for his own behalf shall cause the reproach. Doesn't really make any sense based upon what the Hebrew says. That's so the idea. So the idea of this verse is quite different. So you're looking at verse 18, which we're going to have to come back to. Right. Yeah, it's pretty hard to translate into English. So the idea is that they stop their reproach, right? Um, so this idea for his, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. So, I mean, it's a lot of different words in there. Uh, but basically the prince causes the, the reproach to cease. Um, and so we need to figure out who this prince is. Um, in this case, uh, you know, in um, they're going to put Mark Anthony in there. Or Anthony. So we're going to have to. I don't I don't agree with this interpretation of this verse um, at all. So I, I don't know. We're going to have to look at that in more in more detail when we get there. We might get there today. Um, but but what I see here is, um, you know, this corrupting of her, the fall of the world, but she shall not stand. Now, so the idea on his side that they're getting from for him, neither be for him, right? So that's why they're putting on his side. So it is implied in the Hebrew. It's, it's not a separate word. It's part of that word to exist, um, to him exist. But there's lots of different things it could mean. I don't think could not prevent his assassination would be what it would mean. So normally the standing up is, is the setting up of a kingdom, right? Because we're going to see Babylon stands, in Greece stands, in Medo-Persia, these kings stand, right? And, and so we have all of these leaders standing. Now, Cleopatra, um, what, what happens to her? So she's going to be connected with, uh, with Julius Caesar, and she's going to be appointed, I guess, king or whatever you want to call her, right? Um, not sure exactly. She's going to rule anyway. So she reigns from 51 to 30 BC. So for 21 years. So she's, she's a ruler of sorts. Right. So she's, she's basically, but when it says she shall not stand, I mean, she does rule, but what does she not do? What is what would this standing be about? Because let's let's go back to the World Economic Forum and the UN and all that. Does the World Economic Forum are they the ones that are going to bring in the Sunday law? They're going to be a part of an alliance, but the one that we look to to bring in the Sunday law, it's all initiated by the United States. Right now, the nations of the world are going to follow. But this is not an initiative of the World Economic Forum. It's not an initiative of the UN, right? Now, the Catholic Church, of course, is behind it. So, I mean, in a sense, the Catholic Church brings in the Sunday law, but using the armies of Rome, using the United States. So in this alliance, Egypt ends up being conquered, but it's never the ruling power, right? So when we look at these kingdoms, they're going to be Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. But we don't have Egypt, right? 
It doesn't go Rome, Egypt, and then, you know, Papal Rome, right? You understand what I'm saying? But the idea that, that this, this, this power does not stand, that Cleopatra, she does not stand. She's going to represent the world. The world in this context is going to fall, right? So the idea is that she shall not stand. The world is not going to, to stand in the place of Rome. Rome still is the final kingdom. And, and she shall not exist to him, against him or for him. It's kind of hard in Hebrew because it's, it's the lamed in, with, with a, a, a vav. It's a dot above it, right? So, low. Right. It's, it, it means, uh, um, against, right, him, or to him, or for him. So it, it's, it's kind of hard to understand what the context would be. So if we're going to put an application into our time, what we're saying is that the world that's going to wonder after the beast, right, uh, and and when we look at this, so let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 17. You know, so hopefully I'm, you know, getting this right. And that this is making sense. But when we deal with Revelation chapter 17, we have, of course, we have a woman here. This is the Catholic Church. So this is the papacy, right? Um, now, we're going to see the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now, in this case, it, you know, it's kind of switched. We got the he being Julius Caesar, right? And Julius Caesar being the papacy and Cleopatra, uh, being the world. Here, the world is the kings of the earth. So the, the genders are switched around in, in these two different stories, but it's the same illustration. So this woman, uh, here, the papacy, right? Uh, the kings of the earth commit fornication with her, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Right. So this is what we see happening in that history, symbol being symbolized in that history. Cleopatra's symbolizing the world, the kings of the earth. Okay. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Okay. Now, when we look at the world, um, remember, we had this, when we studied this, we came to the conclusion that these seven kings are the, the presidents of the United States. That there is this, this way that in which we had looked at Revelation 17, which, which doesn't really make sense. But, but we did it that way because that's just how we did it. And, and so now that we've looked at it, we can say that these seven kings are not uh, uh, the same as the kings of the earth, right? They're not the same. It's not talking about the kings of the earth. And, and that this, this uh, explanation of this is the beast of Revelation 13, okay? Now, the ten horns, these are the kings of the earth, Right? So you got ten, 10 horns, which are 10 kings. These seven kings are the kings of the United States, the presidents. These, this is the world. They've received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Is this what Cleopatra does? Yes. Okay. So this is talking about the same history. Cleopatra is representing this history. She represents the world, the ten horns, the ten kings. Right? Because we take the ten horns as being the UN. Right? The world. Okay? Does that help a little bit? It's adding a completely different perspective. Okay. Yeah. So it, it is a bit different perspective. So 
you know, because we see Cleopatra, we'll see, well, she's a woman, right? So she, she must be a church, right? That's normally how we would look at it. But she's not just a woman. She's the daughter of, wo- of women that's being given to the papacy, right, to Julius Caesar. You know, so we can say then that this is the UN, that this is the dragon power. Okay? That's what Cleopatra is representing. You know, so this, this sort of goes against what we sometimes do. We say a woman represents a church. We're saying no. In this case, the daughter of woman that is given to the papacy is this dragon power. And, and we can see that, that that has happened. Right? Now, this is going to cause her ruin. Right? So that the world is going to fall. It being given to the papacy isn't going to to help it. So she shall not stand on his side, or she shall not stand. Now, that is, when we have this threefold union, who's the head of this threefold union? Is it the guy who's the head of the UN? Is it the president of the United States? Or it is the Pope that's the head of this threefold union? Which one's going to stand? So who's going to be the head of the world? The president of the United States, who's ever in charge of the UN, let's say uh, Justin Trudeau, if he ever gets his wish, or um, or the or the Pope in that threefold union. Who, who's who's in charge? Yeah, the Pope. He gets to sit upon the throne of the world, and and he's been maneuvering. Through, through history, but through all of the, these events that we have passed through, right? We, we see him exalt himself to establish the mission prior to 1989. And in 1989, along with the United States, they take down the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union still survives, or not the Soviet Union, but atheistic communism still survives, even though the Soviet, Soviet Union doesn't. And it exists in uh, the UN, in this dragon power. So atheistic communism is alive and well, even though the Soviet Union is taken down. So we focused upon the Soviet Union as being the enemy, and also China, right? These atheistic countries. But there's nothing more atheistic or communistic than the globalist agenda of the United Nations, right? We really wouldn't say that the United Nations is about, um, you know, the American Constitution. It's not the promised land. It's the world, right? So, so Cleopatra must represent this. And, and that's what's going to happen. It's going to cause her ruin. But she shall not stand, right? So on his side, and, and I'm even going to do more than this. I'm just going to go. So this isn't about not supporting someone. This is just plainly uh, neither be for him, right? So this word um, is exist. <clears throat> And, and for him, this him, of course, must be the papacy, right? Now, to say that it historically neither be for him, um, I don't know, you know, I mean, the him, we would just say, well, it's going to be Julius Caesar. But we do have another him that's involved if we take it as God. So she shall not be for God. Or it could be, you know, because for him is kind of uh, the um, the idea is to him. So uh, or against him, either be against him or for him. So it's for or against. It's, it's hard to know. But I don't think that we would put could not prevent his assassination. I don't think that that's what's 
being talked about. Now, of course, we, we have in the next verse Mark Anthony being uh, introduced. So, so this idea after this, the occupation of Egypt, shall he, Caesar, turn his face unto the Isles, the Mediterranean Basin, and shall take many, eliminate all uh, political enemies, but a prince for his own behalf, Mark Anthony, shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease, uh, protect Caesar's political interests in Rome, Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him, defend Caesar against the Roman Senate. And he, Caesar, shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, Rome, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. That's Caesar's assassination in 44 BC. So that's, that's the way this is generally understood. Um, so I, I just, I'm just gonna get rid of this last bit here. Oh, you can't see what I'm looking at. Okay, so I'm just going to get rid of that. So I don't, I don't know what that means, but I don't think it has to do with his assassination. So we don't have the historical application specifically there that we can compare it. Uh, just about the fall of the world. It's more a continuation of she shall not arise or stand. She shall not establish her government in, in that sense doesn't become the, the, the leader and and not exist uh, for him or to him, right? So after this, the occupation of Egypt. So now we have uh, verse 18. <clears throat> so to look at this, we're going to go to uh, Daniel and Revelation and just see what Uriah Smith says about it and how it would have been understood generally. Okay. Okay. War in Syria and Asia Minor against Pharnakes, king of Sumerian Bosphorus, drew Julius Caesar away from Egypt. On his arrival, where the enemy was, says Credo, he, without giving any respite either of himself or them, immediately fell on and gained an absolute victory over them, an account whereof he wrote to a friend in, in of his in these three words, Veni Vidi Vici. I came, I saw, I overcame or conquered. Um, the latter part of this verse is involved in some obscurity, and there is a difference of opinion in regard to its application. Some apply it further back in Caesar's life and think they find a fulfillment in his quarrel with Pompey or Pompey, but preceding and subsequent events clearly defined in the prophecy compel us to look for the fulfillment of this part of the prediction between the victory over Pharnaces, or however you say his name, and Caesar's death at Rome as brought to view in the following verse, right? Which is verse, he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, he shall stumble, fall, not be found, right? So that's verse 19. Any thoughts about this so far? I mean, the idea that he's going to turn his face towards the Isles, that makes sense that he's going to uh, seek to finish his work in the Mediterranean. So he, he controls Egypt. Um, and Caesar's going to turn his face toward the Isles. Now, what about the Isles themselves as, as a prophetic symbol? What does that mean as a prophetic symbol? The Isles. Where, where do we see that? Well, the word itself is just pronounced E. Uh, it comes from uh, a Hebrew word that means Ava, so it doesn't seem to make sense that it comes from it's 183 and it comes from 3, or it's, it's 339 and it comes from 183. Now, this word shows up quite a bit. So remember we had it um, in, in Daniel 11.11, right? So in Daniel 11.11, it says, It shall come to pass in that day, or not I, Daniel 11, Isaiah 11.11. 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Okay, 
So in Isaiah 11, 11, which is an important verse because of the symbol of Daniel 11, 11 and other 11, 11s, this is the verse that Ellen White refers to um, in early writings, page 74, right? That is, is said in, in early writings that it's on September 23rd that she had this vision, but it's actually October 23rd. Right, so it's it's one month off. And that's just a a typo that kept getting repeated. A mistake by James White when he was copying from her visions, uh, he interpreted it as September when it was actually October. So what are we supposed to understand about this verse, Isaiah eleven eleven? Here, I guess I should show you what we're looking at. So what's the first time? Because it says, it shall come to pass in that day, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. But when's the first time? So the first time is going to be when they leave Egypt. The second time is going to be the captivity in Babylon, correct? Now, the first time this verse is mentioned is Genesis 10, and verse 5, which is a symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations, right? So this is about the nations, right? Actually, the word Gentiles and nations are the same Hebrew word. By these were the isles of the Goyim divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their Goyim, right? So, so they use nations, but the word Gentiles is just the word nations, Okay, so so we have this symbol. We can say it's, we can attach it to the tenth day of the fifth month, right? So that's Ezekiel, you know, the destruction of the temple, and and this is a call out of Babylon. Is there a call out of Babylon connected with our history? Yes, Revelation eighteen. Yeah. Okay. So. So we can see how this um, these aisles in um, you know in this story. I mean, we have the Mediterranean, of course. That's what the islands of the sea. That, that's the Mediterranean. But he's going to turn his face unto the isles. So this is the papacy. Does it turn its face unto the isles? And does it take away many? I added the word take away many. I would think that it would have to. Okay. So, okay. So if we're going to, um, I'm just going to try to find. So it's, it's, it's not Isaiah. It's Daniel chapter 11, verse 44. So that's what I'm looking at this parallel. Right. Because remember, we've already made this parallel in Daniel chapter 11, uh, dealing with Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Right. So so we've already made this comparison. You can see that they're they're connected. Um, so when we get to uh, verse 18. And he turns, so this is the papacy turning its face towards the isles, uh, right, the islands. And in Daniel eleven forty four, but the tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. Or we could say take away many, right? Does that make sense? That this is... This is what's being referenced. And we can compare these these two. I think that's possible. Okay. Okay, so when he turns his face towards the Isles, this is the papacy, right? We're saying the Julius Caesars symbolizing the papacy in that history of the Sunday law. And he shall make uh, or take away many. So there's <clears throat> some things we're going to have to sort out when we look at this again tomorrow. Um, 
because I got to I got to think about a lot of this. I wasn't really ready for verse eighteen yet. But we're gonna, we're going to look at it again. We got some interesting words here and symbols. Now there's something here I, I have to think about. Okay, so we're going to close with prayer. And we'll come back to this tomorrow. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning for each person. And we just pray for a blessing upon our day and upon all that we do. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in you and bring us together again according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.